Welcome to the second lecture about the false discovery rate. We'll here have a look at the Benjamin and Hochberg method that can be used to control the false discovery rate below a certain value. The Benjamin and Hochberg method was published in 1995. Remember from the previous lecture that the false discovery rate is the expected proportion of false positives among the total number of rejected hypotheses or discoveries which is the sum of the false and true positives. Usually, one wants to control the false discovery rate to 5%, which means that we accept that the number of false positives among all positive results is equal to 5%. To learn how the benjamin hochberg method works, we'll use it on a simple example with 8 p-values generated from 8 independent statistical tests. The method can either adjust the significance level or adjust the p-values. Both methods will result in the same conclusion. We'll first discuss how we can adjust the significance level and then see how we can adjust the p-values. The first step in the benjamin hochberg method is to sort the p-values. When the smallest p-value gets the rank 1, the next smallest p-value gets the rank 2 and the third smallest p-value gets the rank 3, and so forth. Then we calculate the critical value for each p-value based on the desired force discovery rate, alpha, the rank, k, and the total number of p-values, n. We'll here set the alpha value to 0 0.05 to control the force discovery rate to 5%. k is the rank, and m is the total number of p-values that we have which is 8 in this example. These are the corresponding critical values for all p-values. Note that the rank is the only thing that is changing during these calculations. Next, we find the largest k for which the p-value is less than the corresponding benjamin hochberg critical value. We see that the p-value with rank 4 is less than the critical value, whereas the subsequent p-values are all greater than their corresponding critical values. Finally, we reject all null hypotheses from 1 to 4, since the fourth p-value was the largest p-value that was less than its corresponding critical value. Note that the hypothesis associated with the third smallest p-value should also be rejected even though its value is bigger than the corresponding critical value. The method can be illustrated graphically by plotting the p-values against the ranks. We can add a cutoff line that goes through the origin with the slope equal to alpha divided by m. The p-value with the largest rank that is below the line determines which null hypotheses that should be rejected. In this case, we will reject the four hypotheses associated with these p-values. We now have a look how we instead can calculate adjusted p-values that are compared to a common critical value. Same as before, we begin by sorting the p-values. Then we compute the following for each sorted p-value. Where p sub k is a sorted p-value, m is the total number of p-values we have, and k is the corresponding rank. Since we have 8 p-values, m is equal to 8. Each p-value is therefore multiplied by 8 divided by its corresponding rank. For example, the third smallest p-value is multiplied by 8 divided by 3, since it has the rank 3. Then we start to adjust the p-values from the largest to smallest. The largest p-value is not adjusted since it is multiplied by 1. The next largest p-value is calculated to 0 0.413. However, since this value is bigger than the previous adjusted p-value, the corresponding adjusted p-value is therefore equal to the previous one since the numbers should not increase. The next calculation results in a value of 0 0.135, which is smaller than the previous adjusted p-value. We therefore use the calculated value as the adjusted p-value. 
The next calculation results in a value of 0 0.082, which is also smaller than the previous adjusted p-value. We continue like this until we reach the top. The adjusted p-values are shown in the last column. Finally, we reject all null hypotheses with an adjusted p-value that is less than 0 0.05, which is our critical value to control the force discovery rate to 5%. We see that only the first four adjusted p-values are lower than 0 0.05. We therefore reject the four hypotheses that are associated with the four smallest p-values. Note: Some adjusted p-values will have identical values due to the nature of the procedure. This means that a lot of adjusted p-values will be identical although the original p-values are not. Recall the example from the gene expression data from the first video about the false discovery rate, where we compare two groups based on 10,000 genes that were simulated by 10,000 t-tests. 5,000 tests were based on two samples drawn from the same distribution. Since the two samples come from the same distribution, there is no difference in the population mean between the two groups. The null hypothesis is therefore true for all these 5,000 tests. In addition, we computed 5,000 t-tests based on two samples drawn from two distributions with different population means. The null hypothesis is therefore false for all these 5,000 tests. After we had computed the 10,000 t-tests, the distribution of the p-values looked like this. Note that the p-values from the tests where the null hypothesis was true are uniformly distributed, whereas the distribution is skewed for the p-values from the tests where the null hypothesis was false. If we would plot all the p-values from the 5,000 tests where the null hypothesis is true against the corresponding rank of all the 10,000 p-values, we see that the points follow a straight line. In comparison, if we plot the p-values from the 5,000 tests where the null hypothesis is false, the p-values instead follow a curve like this. If we combine these two plots, we see that it should be possible to separate the p-values from the test where the null hypothesis is true from the ones where the null hypothesis is false. This is exactly what the Benjamin and Hochberg method does. It places a cutoff line between the two different shapes of the curve. Let's make this a bit clearer where we only have 100 p-values, where 90 p-values represented by the blue points come from tests where the null hypothesis is true, and 10 tests represented by the orange points from where the null hypothesis is false. Note that only the 20 smallest p-values are included in this plot. The following Benjamin and Hochberg cutoff line makes a good job in separating the p-values from the tests where the null hypothesis is false from the tests where the null hypothesis is true. If we would use a simple cutoff value, such as a significance level of 0 0.05, we would include a lot more false positives. And if we would use a significance level based on the Bonferroni method, where we divide the significance level by the number of tests that we do, we will not identify any false positives, but very few true positives. If we apply the Benjamin and Hochberg method on the data with 10,000 genes, we will discover 1,184 differentially expressed genes in comparison to the Bonferroni method, which only discovers three differentially expressed genes. However, for the Benjamin and Hochberg method, we expect that about 5% of these 1184 genes are false positives, whereas the Bonferroni method results in almost no false positives. Note that the original Benjamin Hochberg method assumes that the null hypothesis is true for all tests. However, if the null hypothesis is false for a large fraction of tests, as it is in this example, the method will result in a lower false discovery rate than the one we desire. For example, if we set the force discovery rate to 5% for our gene expression data, the actual force discovery rate would be much lower than the expected 5%.
Several methods have been developed to estimate the fraction of true null hypotheses in order to better control the false discovery rate. In the next lecture, we'll have a look at Story's method. See you in the next video.